Great. Hi, everyone. I'm Eleanor, and I'm a member of CurveX. To get started, I'd love to introduce our first speaker, Neil. Neil is a junior in the College of Arts and Sciences, double majoring in English and Biological Sciences. His research focuses on the relationships between cerebral spinal fluid circulation and neurodegenerative disease pathogenicity. I will now hand it over to Neil to present his research. Hi everyone, my name is Neil. I'm a junior in the College of Arts and Sciences, and I'm broadly interested in how Alzheimer's disease and CSF or cerebral spinal fluid are related. And to understand how these two are related, we sort of have to take a step back and look at what causes Alzheimer's disease. And so pathologically, we know that Alzheimer's disease is caused by the buildup of two specific proteins, beta amyloid and tau. Now beta amyloid and tau are both proteins that are found in everybody. Beta amyloid is implicated in cell cellular signaling. Tau is implicated in motor transport within cells. And we all have normal concentrations of these two proteins. But in the case of Alzheimer's disease, what happens is both of these proteins start aggregating and their aggregation causes signaling pathways to get disrupted and leads to the death of neurons. And the death of neurons is normally occurring in the hippocampal regions of the brain, which is responsible for memory formation, which is why whenever you see an Alzheimer's patient, their biggest symptoms are almost always memory loss and the inability to form new memories. So how does this happen? Well, we know that beta amyloid from years of biochemical studies is formed by the cleavage of a precursor protein called APP. APP stands for amyloid precursor protein. And in normal people like us, APP is cleaved into a regular form of beta amyloid, which can then go and help the cell signal. In cases of Alzheimer's disease, the cleavage of APP is abnormal. And that leads to a specific form of beta amyloid, which ends up aggregating. And again, that aggregation is what leads to neuronal death. So how is this related to CSF? Well, we know that in pathological states in the body, our body normally has a mechanism to counteract that, to bring it back to homeostasis, to bring it back to a physiological norm. And that's what CSF does. CSF is produced in the brain and it acts as a garbage dump for all of the toxic metabolites that the brain produces. And just to emphasize the amount of beta amyloid and tau that's necessary for AD progression, here's a PET scan where you have healthy participants that have a certain amount of A beta and a certain amount of tau this would be representative of like you and I. And in Alzheimer's disease, both proteins are significantly more pronounced, which is a reflection of the aggregation of these two proteins that is leading to neuronal death. So going back to CSF, how does this relate to CSF? Well, CSF is produced in the ventricles of the brain. The ventricles are cavities in your brain that are lined with special epithelium that filter blood to produce this liquid called CSF. And it essentially circulates through your subarachnoid space which is right in between your meninges at like the outer skull. And then it goes into your brain and removes some of these toxic metabolites. Contextualized to Alzheimer's disease, this means that A beta and tau, which are now building up in AD patients, CSF clears those proteins from the brain. And so how is this useful? Well, we know that if CSF is taking proteins out of the brain, and we also know that in Alzheimer's, these two proteins are elevated, then you can understand that in CSF, an elevation of these two proteins would be indicative of elevation of those two proteins in the brain as well. And so that allows you to sort of look at the CSF, extract the CSF, send it to a lab, and measure the levels of A, beta, and tau to figure out whether a person has Alzheimer's or they don't. Now, why do we look at CSF? Well, we know that Alzheimer's disease is happening in the central nervous system, and CSF is one of those fluids that circulates in the CNS, but ultimately leaves the CNS. And so our methods of trying to examine CSF currently are very expensive, they're very invasive, and they're potentially dangerous. This normally consists of a spinal tap where you have a neurosurgeon who extracts a little bit of CSF from your spinal cord, which can then get sent to a lab for an evaluation. But theoretically, if we can find other pathways for CSF that's not in the spinal cord or brain, you can then use it to devise a biochemical method of diagnosing Alzheimer's disease that doesn't actually require you to invade the brain or spinal cord. And so this frontier of where does the CSF go is a huge area of research that led to a very groundbreaking paper in 2009, where they looked at a bunch of animals and they traced CSF. 
using a tracer called a microfill, which shows up in blue. Um, and so this is a mouse brain from this study. And essentially what they found was they found that CSF circulates in the brain, which we know, and is cleared across the cribriform plate, which is what like the bone that separates your nasal epithelium from your brain. And they found CSF crossing that boundary and entering the nose and then going down into the body. And this was confirmed in mice, rats, dogs, cats, and one postmortem human. So what does this mean? This means that in theory, if you have significant CSF clearance across the cribriform plate into the nose, you can now like create a diagnostic test that uses your nasal fluid to then test for A beta and tau levels and consequently diagnose Alzheimer's disease. The question is, does this pathway actually exist in humans? Because this study only used one postmortem sample and we still don't know, right? Whether that one postmortem sample is fully representative of like living human beings. So this is where our group decided to take a look at the nasal fluid and the nasal circulation of CSF. Now, before we go into that, it's kind of important that we understand the anatomy of this area. And so what would that look like in humans? Well, we know that based off of years of anatomical study that our nose, our nasal epithelium has lymphatic drainage, which is shown in the branching yellow lymph vessels. And so our theory was that if there's all of the CSF that's going into the nose in animals, technically evolutionarily, we would assume that there's a similar pathway in humans. And so we assumed that you would find CSF drainage across the cribriform plate into the lymphatic nasal drainage of humans. And then from the lymphatic vessels of the nose, it then drains into your regular uh, lymphatic system. How do we test this? Our primary method of testing this was through PET imaging. And so essentially what we did was we took two tracers, ATF THK5117 and 11 Pittsburgh compound seeds. Um, and both of these tracers are beta amyloid and tau tracers of CSF. So essentially, wherever these two tracers go is theoretically where the beta amyloid and the tau is going within the CSF. And so if we were to theorize that we will see CSF clearance into the nose, then we should theoretically be able to find these tracers going into the nose after you inject people with it, with pet imaging. And so that's exactly what we did. There was intravenous injection of these two tracers, which is just straight into the blood, you inject these two tracers and you monitor it with pet imaging over time. And what we found is significant CSF clearance in the nose. So if you look at the top panel, anything in red is where the tracer was found. And so we were talking about CSF circulation, right? So we know that CSF circulates in the subarachnoid space at the top of the skull. And this is consistent with that, but we also found a very high positivity in the nasal epithelium. So what does that tell us? That tells us that we now have primary evidence in live human beings that CSF is cleared across the cribriform plate into the nasal epithelium. Now, this study alone seems like really clear evidence that CSF goes into the nose and then goes down the lymphatic drainage, but the evidence is actually very conflicting. We used PET imaging, there is another very famous neuroscientist in Germany who used MRI, who did the exact same thing. Um, and he found something completely different. And so here, his idea was the same. You inject a person with a tracer, you follow where the tracer goes, and if the tracer theoretically ends up in the nose, then you know that CSF is entering the nose. And what do you see here? Well, we see very little nasal involvement. You see a little bit there right across the cribriform plate, but overall in the nasal epithelium, there's very little involvement of CSF tracers. So what does this mean? This means that when we compare our two imaging modalities, we have a stark contrast between what we're finding. In PET imaging, which is on the left, or in your left, we find high CSF positivity in the nasal epithelium. In MRI studies, we find the exact opposite. And both of these seem to suggest that we still don't know whether CSF goes into the nose or it doesn't. How do you reconcile these two? So our group's theory is that CSF is entering the nose through, um, tr through fluid across the cribriform plate, and it's not showing up on MRI because it's significantly less pronounced than it would be in animals. But again, when you have two imaging modalities that are saying contrasting things, it becomes really important to figure out how to integrate the two. So where does this leave us? Well, we know that PET imaging is showing us clear evidence of nasal transgression of CSF, and MRI is showing us the exact opposite. So now it becomes paramount for us to integrate the two. If we can sort of figure out 
one study design that uses both PET and MRI in the same people, you can then theoretically reconcile those two findings. And additionally, you should think about how we can image CSF that's outside of PET and MRI. In both of our methods, PET and MRI, in these two studies presented, we used injection of tracer. That's invasive. Is there a way for us to view CSF without even like injecting somebody with a tracer? Maybe, maybe not. In surgery, they use MR cisternography and MR myelography to image CSF leakage. So maybe we can try and find CSF leakage in patients across the nose and see if we can use that technology to then assess CSF clearance into the nasal system. Additionally, it becomes important for us to look at tracers. Are the tracers that we're looking at actually indicative of where beta amyloid and tower go? Could they be potentially going into other fluids? We are assuming that they're going into the CSF. They could be potentially going into like the extracranial fluid or the intracellular fluid, the extracellular fluid. And if that's happening, then wherever our tracer is showing up is no longer indicative of where the CSF is going. So despite all of these different differences, it becomes really important for us to do a bunch more research on tracer, tracer efficacy, multiple imaging modalities, and most importantly, biological validation of CSF flow. What does that mean? That means that a PET image will show you, here's where the tracer is. Does that actually represent the CSF pathway? It might represent where the beta amyloid is going, but does it represent where the CSF is taking it? Our question then becomes, how can you, without doing neurosurgery, find where the CSF actually is in the brain? It's very easy to do, easy to do in like mice, because you can just open up a mouse, you can examine their brain, you can find the fluid. It's much more difficult to do that in humans, obviously. So the question of biological validation becomes really important. So ultimately, this is a very brief summary of like the brain nose connection and CSF clearance. If you are interested more in this topic, these are two papers that I've published. The one on the left is, our, is out in January. The one on the right should be out next month. Um, but overall, I think the takeaway here is to realize that whenever we think about neurodegeneration, it's almost always in the context of like symptoms of patients and we always relegate it to the brain. But in reality, biological systems are always integrated. And it becomes important for us to realize that research on neurodegenerative disease is not limited to the brain. It can be so many different things. It can be immune in nature, it can be CSF in nature. And so it becomes important for us to consider neurodegeneration as a holistic biological process instead of like just the brain. Um, are there any questions? so much for that amazing presentation. Now I'd like to open the Q&A round to Neil. So if you have a question, please raise your hand. Yeah. Um, thank you. That is actually really interesting. I learned a lot because I have someone in my lab that used to work on like on their own, uh, on Alzheimer's as well. And I guess my question would be, do you have a theory or like explanation for why you think that maybe MRI versus PET have dip those differences like within the, like those, uh, those imaging techniques. Yeah, uh, so PET scans are significantly more sensitive to tracers. And so in theory, if this pathway is like very minimal, a PET scan will pick it up while an MRI won't, simply because a PET scan is much more sensitive to the tracers that we're using, whereas an MRI is not. Any other questions? Yeah. See like brain and nose imaging or like nose brain. CSF brain. No, no, it's not that. Yeah, so I think the reason that they use well, first of all, Alzheimer's disease is cognitive in nature, right? So like, there's two particular cognitive tests that they use a lot: MMSC and MOCA, and those two tests are very rapidly used to diagnose Alzheimer's disease. But a cognitive assessment can only take you so far, which is why they rely on brain imaging. And the reason that they don't use spinal taps as much to diagnose Alzheimer's is exactly because it's a spinal tap that is really invasive. So if you could establish a brain nose connection with CSF, then that opens you up to an entire new realm of diagnostics where maybe you don't even have to get a brain image. 
you can just look at the CSF in the nose, which is like a quick prick, send it to a lab, and then you know the beta amyloid tau levels, and that will consequently tell you the condition of the brain inside. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm not very familiar with the biology of CSF, but I assume that is it processed in any other part of the body that could possibly be uh, AF affected as well? Like, are you asking if it's taken out of the nervous system anywhere else? Yeah, like, is, it, is like the CSF that, like, I guess, would tend to pick up these like proteins and you could see that there, is it processed anywhere else in the body that could be tested? Well, it would be processed in the lymph. Um, but I think the issue with testing it downstream, like after it's being processed, is those proteins would get broken down. And so then you would have to find some like intermediate where the lymph is, like you can still access or separate the CSF from the overall lymph without having broken down the proteins. Because if you break down the proteins and you're all the way like down in like the regular lymph vessels, then you no longer have diagnostic potential because the proteins are no longer there. I think that's why there's a lie on it right after it leaves the brain. Okay, so we'll take one more question. Yeah. Uh, did the scientists who did the MRI in Germany find any significance to the leakage into the nose? He attributed it to tracer efficacy, where he thought that tracers, the tracer he was using was really small. So he assumed that that minute leakage was not an actual flow pathway, but the tracer just like squeezing through blood vessels. And because of that, he decided that that little leakage was like completely irrelevant, which is entirely possible. Okay, and with that last question, I'd like to conclude the Q&A round. Thank you for all those questions and thank you to Neil for your great presentation. I'll hand it off to Olivia to present our next speaker. <laughs> Everyone. My name is Olivia. I'm another, another member of the Paramedic Committee. I'm excited to introduce our second speaker of the night, Henry. Henry is a senior studying public policy with economic research experience at the Federal Reserve Bank, the Roper Center for Public Opinion Research, and the Jed E. Brooks School of Public Policy. Today, Henry will be presenting his research on how Google searches can help predict the unemployment rate, which is especially relevant today given the ongoing pandemic. I'll hand it off to Henry now to get uh, hello everyone, I'm uh, Henry. It is estimated that 315,000 Google searches have been made since I began speaking. How do I tie a tie? Wait, who is Pete Davidson's new girlfriend? <laughs> uh, guys, why does my knee hurt? While well, each of these searches on their own is probably more embarrassing than empirically relevant, interesting researchers, research questions stem from observing several million of them and over time. Google's chief economist, Dr. Hal Varian, was the first to explore how searches for the word unemployment trend with the actual rate of unemployment in the United States. Several studies followed to replicate this result and extend the predictive power of otherwise trivial Google searches to things like Chilean car sales, uh, national oil consumption, consumption stock prices, COVID cases. In addition to helping economists forecast future values of the unemployment rate, Google search data provides a unique opportunity in making high frequency predictions. Imagine a small town whose chronicle writes the names of babies born each calendar month in the Sunday paper. Living close to the hospital, you often see pregnant mothers being frantically escorted out of ambulances and into the front doors. If you wanted to predict how many babies were born each day, you could keep track of the number of times an ambulance sirens blared that day. But people get in accidents. They gloriously attempt backflips on black diamonds despite just making it down the bunny hill. They build blow torches out of sunscreen bottles and they eat delicious looking wild berries that they probably shouldn't have. And sometimes it's just difficult to tell an ambulance siren apart from that of a police car. That said, not all siren blares are indicative of a birth. And while the number of sirens will not directly lead you to the number of births, it will still help you guess. If you observe that 200 blares in the month of February led to 150 baby names listed in the paper, you can infer that 75% of siren blares on any given day are for ambulances with mothers in labor. You can repeat this exercise for the months of March, April, and so on until, until you feel as though you can make an informed uh, guess based on many data points. Alas, a daily prediction 
of the number of bursts that comes from isolating the signal amidst, quite literally, in this case, the noise. In my research, I investigate the small town ambulance problem but using Google, weekly Google search data to predict the monthly unemployment rate. In the United States, the unemployment rate gets reported on the first Friday of each month, which means that by the time it gets reported, the previous figure is a whole month stale. However, since Google search data is available weekly, and a clear correlation exists between certain search terms and the actual rate of unemployment, weekly predictions can be made. A key question in policymaking is not how to act, but instead when. In many cases, we already know which policy buttons to push. It's just that we don't actually know precisely when to. What contributes to the decision to act is often only an estimate or a prediction of a true parameter, which is informed by imperfect data. In the case of the labor market, the rate of unemployment is a statistic that facilitates not only monetary policy set forth by the Federal Reserve Bank, but also private investment decisions. And while central banks and private credit markets both have their tools to correct for turbulent labor economics, the challenge of knowing precisely when to act persists. So as opposed to being this astute observer who kind of peers out their window and learns that siren blares are correlated with births, I would build machine learning models that can discern these relationships on their own. Consider the following example. Each blue dot is a data point in two-dimensional space. Suppose the x-axis is age and the y-axis is the number of people attending your birthday party when you turn that age. And because your relatives live far away, you throw a birthday party every other year as opposed to each year. When you turn two, around 12 people come to your birthday party. How special. Even more exciting, when you turn four, a staggering 24 friends, real and fake, up for you to decide, and family members attend your birthday party. Now, it's two years down the road, and your parents ask you who you'd like to invite to your sixth birthday party. The big day is fast approaching, Henry, and we need to figure out this catering. How many people might they already expect are coming to your birthday party? Let's revisit some basic algebra. Y equals mx plus b. We observe that when you were zero, three people were there to celebrate. So regardless of how old you were turning, it is guaranteed that at least three people will be there. But in recent years, more and more people have been able to come. In fact, it seems that 10 more guests come every two years, and so five more guests each year. So if you know that five more guests come every year and you are turning six, in addition to the original three who are always solid bets, your parents might predict that 33 people will be in this party's attendance. And boy, were they wrong. Your sixth birthday party is a flop. Only 13 guests, including your nuclear family of 11, attend. <laughs> Tough go. What this failed birthday party demonstrates, though, is the spirit of machine learning. The y equals mx plus b trick has a, mu trick mu has a much fancier name, linear regression, which is applied to real world data to generalize its pattern or trend. In this case, our prediction is quite poor. But we may have expected that since there are many other variables aside from age that might help us predict the number of people who would have come to our birthday party. What I do is build large data sets full of variables that are predictive of the rate of unemployment and run similar models. The data comes from our Google searches and looks something like this. This graph shows how often searches for Cornell University are made in the state of New York for each week, 2017 to the present. Now, imagine it's not just Cornell that you're interested in and not just in New York. It's hundreds of additional terms and for all 50 states, tens of thousands of graphs that look just like this, each with several hundred data points. Using all of this data together, over 4 million data points, I predict each state's unemployment rate. The best performing model is 33% more accurate than the canonical forecasting method. A result novel not only because it provides a more accurate guess of what the unemployment rate will be next month, but it almost also opens the door for making weekly predictions. I think the results from Wyoming show this quite well. On this graph, Wyoming's unemployment rate is this red line, uh, which is reported from late 2016 to late 2021. We observed a slow and stable decrease in the rate of unemployment prior to the pandemic, where it then rose to levels unseen since the Great Depression. The blue line here is the current best guess we have for unemployment. The values are predictions generated by the traditional forecasting model that many economists use in this case. In many aspects, this is actually quite a good prediction. This task is hard, and as you can see, the predictions rem resemble a very similar pattern to the true values of unemployment. However, when using the large swath of Google search data and generating predictions with machine learning, we observe the green line. 
much closer to the truth and with smaller errors. This approach works. It's not just Wyoming, too. It's New York. It's California. It's Idaho. In every state, there is at least one machine learning model that beats out the benchmark and does so using this Google search data. What seems like an embarrassing thing to type into Google may eventually be critical information that economists use to forecast future values of the unemployment rate or the like. If any of your Google searches in the past five years have contained any of these words, this research is made possible by you. This result is indicative of a broader change. Our world is only ever becoming more digital. Our footsteps are no longer in the sand, but instead in the things we ask search engines, the buttons we click on web pages, the articles we choose to read. And while for some this might be concerning, with it comes new tools and new data that are used to understand human behavior and intelligence, predict the future state of economies, find cancer cells early, the list continues. Large amounts of seemingly trivial data will hold such power in the century, especially with the help of machine learning. So when you hear these words, big data, machine learning, algorithm, I urge you to not be immediately fearful of implications. While they are indeed imperfect systems, fraudulent and cruel use cases, sly commercial incentives, there are also many benefits. Things we retain by doing our work with integrity and empathy. By understanding the structure of the problem at hand and including extra controls, data considerations, or in some cases, exclusions. Be critical. Think about the pros and cons and in which settings there are gains or losses to be had. While at times technology seems so advanced and hard to relate to, it is very much our own and is designed to better understand us. And thus, we live our lives to validate these technologies, push back on problematic approaches, but also learn to appreciate the ones that work. Thank you. Thank you for that amazing presentation. I now like to open up the QA round. If you have any questions, questions, please. Yeah. How did you structure your training test analytics? Sorry? How did you structure your training test analytics? Yeah, so it was 80 20 or 80 10 10. So 10% 10 of the data I never saw till you know all the models were tuned. 80% of the data was, or yeah, 80% of the data was used to kind of train these models. Uh, both, you know, linearly specified and non-parametric models we see kind of canonically uh, machine learning and the other 10 was just kind of uh, to validate those models. And that was all temporal based on based on timing. So I wasn't holding out any states based on size or anything. It was strictly just kind of uh, as time marched along. Which in many cases was kind of a handicap because the COVID pandemic created such kind of heterogeneity in, in both Google terms that I was using and also the rate of unemployment. Any other questions? Great question. So I guess this, the status quo in this area of research is kind of trial and error. There's many restrictions that Google imposes on the data that you might be interested in for many reasons, privacy, commercialization, et cetera. Uh, that said, you can only really find uh, kind of exciting results if you have very predictive uh, you know, features, things that might explain the rate of unemployment. Um, so I, I take several approaches. One, I kind of revisit previous works and see what authors in the space that they're using. Second is I build large uh, corpuses of text from like federal open market committee documents, Bureau of Labor Statistics reports, and use text extraction to get some keywords to see maybe what our government, what our policymakers uh, use to describe things like the unemployment rate, and then kind of plug those into these requests that I make from the Google Trends database. Um, and it doesn't actually seem to matter all too much. Any other questions? Uh, green sweatshirt back there. Yeah, there are two of uh, kind of particular interest in the space. They're interesting because they're not often used in time series forecasting due to some of their shortcomings. But the two I take a look at are random forest regression and gradient boost of trees. Um, you know, they, they have trade-offs. I, you know, tried specifying the artificial neural network, but that has some high fixed costs that I didn't necessarily have time for. <laughs> okay, I think we have time for one last question. Uh, what do you choose to study on the That's a great question. So, um, I had first heard that the Federal Reserve Bank was using high-frequency data, not with uh, Google Trends, but 
with Google and Google Mobilities. They were tracking uh, how people's movement at the census tract level correlated with things like consumer sentiment, uh, CPI, uh, consumer sales. And I thought it was kind of a natural uh, implication or kind of natural, uh, I don't know, step to take a look at how something like our Google searches might predict things like the rate of unemployment. It had been done with initial claims, one of the um, slides I had shown previously, which is kind of a direct high frequency measure of the rate of unemployment. But I wanted to take a look at the, the actual rate of unemployment and see how uh, you know our Google searches might help us make a prediction of, of uh, that parameter. Okay, with that last question, I'd like to conclude our Twitter round of attendance. <laughs> My name is Lillian, and I'm also a member of Urban X this year. So I'm excited to introduce our third speaker, Tay Young. Tay Young is a senior in the College of Human Ecology, majoring in Human Biology, Health, and Society. She'll be double, double minoring in Gerontology and Human Development. She will be presenting research that aims to spotlight informal family caregivers, who are the invisible patients often overlooked in our healthcare system. Tay Young, the floor is yours. Can everyone hear me in the back? Hi, my name is Tayon. Um, I'm a senior in HPHS, and my study focuses on what motivates physicians to help caregivers. And this is translational research, which aims to translate the study findings onto a healthcare context to make more uh, immediate benefits available to patients and physicians. So first, to introduce you to the concept of caregivers, I would like us to acknowledge that there is a high prevalence of chronic conditions in older adults, defined as those um, above the age of 65. And these conditions can compromise these older adults' cognition, ability, and ability to carry out daily tasks. So um, when these older adults are not at the hospital, who takes care of them? It's usually family caregivers. So these are family members or friends. They are untrained, unpaid, non-professional. And these circumstantial aspects kind of put them into this role of caregiving. And they help maintain continuity of care at home. Their tasks range from you know, managing vacations, accompanying patients to uh, medical visits, to bathing or feeding them on a daily basis, depending on the patient's condition. Unfortunately, the tools of caregiving put them at significant risk for what's called caregiver's burden. And it's defined as the physical, emotional, financial, and social um, consequences or hardships that come with care provision. And as you can see here, there are many dimensions to caregiver's burden. For instance, someone might be afflicted with a minor injury that might just take months to recover, but in more progressive chronic conditions like dementia, um, the caregiver usually has to be a caregiver for years to decades and so on until the patient passes away or is put into a nursing home. And also, again, the intensity of caregiving can vary, and one person, like a son or a daughter, might have to be a caregiver for both their parents. And another thing to consider is that patients. Um, symptoms changes as the disease progresses, and as they age, the symptoms also change. So the caregiver must adapt to these changing demands of the patient, which can be very stressful. So in some, this can put a lot of stress on the caregiver, affecting their quality of life, their health, and even their ability to provide adequate care for the patient. So it's important to address caregiver's role because um, Caregivers' well-being has been correlated to direct outcomes in the patient, such as their nursing home placements and their mortality rates. So what can physicians do to help caregivers? First of all, they're, they are well situated to address caregivers because, again, caregivers accompany patients to medical visits. And it is a good space for them to open up talking about the hardships of patient care, um, any new changes in the patient condition, and so forth. Um, however, caregivers report a lack of emotional and health support from physicians, and studies indicate that physicians underutilize the assessment tools available to help identify caregiver needs and risks. 
So given the importance of uh, caregiver self, so doctors have an ethical obligation for the caregiver self, and also it's going to help them improve patient outcomes if they are to help caregivers. So how can we motivate physicians to do so? To find out how we can do that, we must identify the psychological variables that intrinsically motivate caregivers to uh, help physicians help caregivers. So that is the topic of my research. And we conducted a male-based survey. Um, it was like six pages, and we had a response of 106 uh, primary care physicians, including geriatricians. It measured a variety of vari variables, including demographic data, information about the patient panel, or information about their practice characteristics. And most importantly, the outcome variable shown on the right side here, which asked about their perceived responsibility to address caregiver needs. So we asked them, do you feel that it is your or other primary care provider's responsibility to do the following tasks to help caregivers? And we hypothesized that there are three variables that might be associated with the outcome variable of perceived responsibility. And the first was experiential similarity. So maybe if the physician has been or is a family caregiver, um, that has personally experienced doing so, maybe they're more likely to identify with caregivers and help them. Or if they share demographic characteristics with most caregivers, for example, if they're um, older adults or female, as most caregivers are female, maybe they're more likely to identify with them. Again, um, another thing I want to emphasize here is that female physician has been shown to be more likely to address social variables in patient care, so that, that's also supporting this reasoning. And the last variable is secondary exposure, which is secondhand experience interacting with older adults and their caregivers. So maybe on their job in the healthcare setting, if they interact more with older adults and their caregivers, they're more likely to address caregiver needs. So again, the hypothesis relates uh, these three variables to the outcome variable of their perceived responsibility. And we decided to measure this variable because in pediatric context, this variable has been linked to the action of addressing uh, caregiver needs, but it has not been uh, observed in a geriatric setting. So again, um, the action of resource utilization and increased attention to caregivers would not only improve caregivers' health, but also patient outcomes. So the clinical implications of this research is very broad. And we found from multivariable logistic regression analysis that physicians with personal caregiving experience or physicians with experiential similarity are four times more likely than those without it to do two things to help caregivers. So one, identify their needs and risks and to address their mental health issues. And we hypothesize that this works through a mechanism of empathy. And this is also based on the theory of experiential similarity and homophily which basically states that if you share a social identity with someone, you're more likely to form and maintain support networks with them. And in the context of our research, we hypothesize that physicians, um, by having the social identity of caregivers, they're more likely to empathize with them, understand, the, understand their needs, be more confident in communicating with them, suggesting resources that maybe they themselves have tried out. So empathy is a very simple concept, but it goes beyond just an abstract thing, right? It actually translates into physicians' counseling practices. So I also want to introduce the concept of self-determination theory. So the last slide I mentioned that physicians with experiential similarity are more confident in interacting and suggesting resources for caregiver. And this builds on self-determination theory, or SDT for short. And in the gray box is SCT, SCT which is a well-established theory in psychology. And whatever is outside it is the novel implication that my research adds to for self-determination theory. So my research suggests that experiential similarity is a source for autonomy, competence, and relatedness. And here, relatedness means feeling a close connection with um, the population of interest. Here, physicians feeling closer to caregivers which can be a source for self-efficacy self and confidence and internalization of feeling the importance of addressing caregiver needs. And this theory has um, originally been used to empower patients to feel confident in initiating and maintaining behaviors related to health outcomes. For example, um, to help quit smoking or to lose weight. 
However, our research suggests that this can be used for um, another context for caregivers behavior change. So maybe if they have been caregivers, they're more confident in interacting with caregiver suggesting strategies, and they're more likely to have changes in their counseling practices to incorporate addressing caregiver needs by suggesting resources or using assessment tools to see if there is a need to address caregiver need. Again, this will help improve caregivers' physical and mental health, again, having an impact on patients' health also. So now we've established that experiential similarity and empathy for caregivers is crucial, not only for the caregiver, but also for the patient. So how do we integrate that into medical education? So what we can do is provide opportunities to physicians to kind of get a deep insight into caregivers' daily lives and for them to interact with them, not only in a healthcare setting, but outside on a regular basis to get to know them as people, not just as someone accompanying their patients in the doctor's room. And an example of that may, might be uh, showing, you know, in-depth interviews with caregivers that talk about their struggles in daily lives and for physicians uh, current or future physicians to listen to them. And something similar has been implemented at Northwestern University um, in a program called the Puppy Program. And what this did was they paired up dementia patients with uh, medical students. And they were encouraged to interact on a regular basis in context, again, outside of the healthcare setting, doing social and cultural activities. And of course, um, these were very often accompanied by the caregivers of the patient, so it was often a triadic encounter between three people. And the results were pretty striking. So the medical students, they interacted with them at least once a month, and that alone was enough to um, have reduced age stereotypes, improve attitudes so towards uh, older adults and patients with dementia, to understand more about what dementia means for the patient, and also contextualize the role of caregiving. So now that we know these implications and the efficacy of these interventions, um, we should expand it so that it's incorporated into continuing medical education for current doctors, and it should be mandated into medical education in the future. And lastly, I would like to emphasize the clinical and social significance of training physicians and empathy for caregivers given um, a couple of current trends in society. First is that we live in an aging society. The baby boomers are aging. Um, adults over the age of 65 have surpassed the number of children under 18 in the US. And again, as I said in the first slide, older adults have a very high prevalence of chronic illnesses, and the numbers will increase as the number of older adults increase. However, there is a current gap in physicians. So there's a physician shortage, and this is especially pronounced in primary care physicians and in geriatricians. So we know there's a gap between the supply and demand of doctors, especially for older adults. So who fills in this gap? Again, it's family caregivers. The burden falls on them to fill in the gap, and thus physicians should be trained to work with caregivers and to address their needs to address this um, lack of care and provided by formal medical training. And my research suggests the novel way to do so by targeting experiential similarity as a factor. Um, that's the end of my research. And I would like to recognize some of my awesome research mentors. If you're ever interested in translational research, um, I highly recommend that you reach out to some of them. Um, and that's it, thank you. Thank you, Pam, for, for presenting your amazing research. Uh, now we'll open up your Q&A round. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Uh, in the back. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, right. Oh, um, do we know why there's a physical shortage? So usually it's because I know that being at Cornell, there's a ton of pre-meds, but there is a shortage of medical schools. Um, and that is the main reason. Like, there's a funneling effect of medical schools and residencies that is limiting the number of physicians. Uh, um, I know, like, uh, talking about the physician shortage, also it has to do with, like, rural areas as well, right? So, I guess, have you thought about the ways in which you can sort of, like, redirect 
positions as well into those spaces. So there's a lot of incentive programs in the government, like, for example, they pay off your uh, med school debts or like they'll pay for your med medical education for you to commit to uh, first five years of your medical training for you being in a rural area. But, um, you know, people have to sign up for that and often the incentive isn't great enough for people to do that. So I really like that question. Um, so my question is regarding like when you collected your data, how, what did you exactly do to get rid of like uh, bias response from all these caregivers, especially because your survey was voluntary based, which can have an impact in who responds what in terms of how important caregiving experience is for them in terms of having empathy towards the patients of their caregivers. So like, I just want to know about what you did to adjust your modeling. Right. So in um, these self-reported surveys, it's impossible to get rid of um, you know, self-reported data, self-reported bias, and a bunch of different biases. But we did um, see that the response rate and other variables were pretty similar to other surveys used by similar um, studies. And also, I adjusted for like multipolarity by um, taking out some of the variables that might be influenced by other variables. So we did use a parsimonious approach in our process. Okay, yeah, we have time for one more question. Uh, yeah, right in the middle. Can you imagine other social safety nets for caregivers besides those such as hospice? Yeah, so the thing is that caregivers are often unidentified, and so health care setting is the best place to kind of identify them. However, there's a lot of other social support networks that are, again, more informal. Um, for example, there's a lot of like support groups that are local, um, and there's a lot of like counseling uh, resources, and like uh, there's also services where other um, like paid caregivers come in for a, uh, like a few weeks or so, so that the or informal caregiver can take a break, or if they're, um, you know, economically able to, they can hire formal caregivers, uh, but they all vary. And I think, um, you know, again, physicians all the, are the best situated to address caregivers. Okay, so with that, we'll conclude our q and round. Thank you, Pam. Sorry, <laughs> Our amazing lineup, we have our fourth speaker, Gigi. Gigi is a senior in arts and sciences, majoring in biological sciences with minors in Asian American studies and inequality studies. Her research focuses on using the organ on a chip model to observe the disease state of pancreatic cancer, specifically targeting its interaction with the lymphatic system. I'll now hand it off to Gigi to start her presentation. So basically, I'm presenting on an organ on a chip model to demystify the complexity of pancreatic cancer. And so just a quick introduction about myself, um, like, so my major and my minors, but also, so I do research in the Lee Lab, which is in the Department of Biomedical Engineering. And being a bio major, I think it has shown me a lot about the intersection of biomedical research with immunology, cancer biology, vascular biology within like engineering disciplines and technology, like understanding fluid dynamics and mechanical pressure. And so I really like my research for the fact that it really shows me a lot of different ways to integrate different aspects of STEM into biology. And so a uh, quick overview of the pancreas. So it's located in your digestive tract and is responsible for secreting hormones like insulin to regulate your blood sugar levels. And if you take a look at on your right, there is um, the change in which you've seen how cancer, re cancer research has improved in the last three decades of increasing the survival rate. So you can see like um, leukemia or bowel cancer has improved significantly. But if you look at the bottom, pancreatic cancer has not moved at all. And why is that the case? Because pancreatic cancer does um, the stage at which it's diagnosed is typically at stage four. And in that case, it's pretty much the tumor has moved past the pancreas and into your lungs, your liver. Um, so with that, at a late diagnosis, diagnosis stage also means a really poor survival rate. So most patients who are diagnosed with pancreatic cancer have about a 10% survival rate after five years of diagnosis. And so 
how can we improve this, right? This seems like a huge problem in which we haven't been able to figure this out in the last 30, 40 years. However, now there is the lymphatic system. Um, it's a body system that has gained a lot more traction within the biomedical research field. And it takes a lot of aspects of the circulatory system, the immune system, and the digestive system. So the core function is to take um, excess fluid from your circulatory system in this form called lymph and filters it out with your immune system by taking out you know, as many parasites, pathogens, and bacteria as possible and replenishing that fluid with nutrients from your digestive system and returning that fluid back into your circulatory system uh, and helping maintain like fluid balance. And so knowing, you know, what we, with the complexity of pancreatic cancer and the integrated um, system of lymphatics, how do we bridge this together? And so introducing organ on a chip, it basically is allows you to uh, stimulate the activities and physiological responses of a specific organ and can help med, um, model the disease state of a specific organ. So in my case, the pancreas. And it helps you diagnose problems that happen at the cellular and molecular level that you can't see in human patients. So it gives us a better idea of, you know, what drug treatments can we use. And it allows for experimentation that isn't possible with human patients, you know, for ethical reasons. You can't really like just play around with different treatments. But in organ on a chip model, you can. You can sort of target specific genes and just like play with all different types of drugs to see if you can find a potential solution. Um, that could eventually translate to a human patient. And so my previous research has been on with blood vessels and uh, pancreatic cancer. And so in this scheme right here, we see um, a quick note. So these are different types of, uh, these are the different cells that I use. So PDAC is just a fancier way of pancreatic cancer cells. And then QVEC resembles um, cells that make up your blood vessels. And so you put one cell, in, one type of cell into one channel and then another type of cell into the other, other channel. And then you can have them meet in the yellow space in the middle, which is represents the extracellular matrix. And you can see here, when you have this interaction happening in that yellow space, you can replicate the tumor invasion process, um, that timeline of um, pancreatic cancer cells coming in to invade that blood vessel cells. Um, the blood vessel channel um, so that you can see how this works with possible drug um, trials and treatments. And what that means afterwards, right? After you treat it with possible drugs on an organ on a chip model, you can then move to an in vivo mouse model where you can give the mice pancreatic cancer and then inject a drug so that you can view different um, states of disease with pancreatic cancer. So you can measure things like metastasis that you can't measure in the organ on a chip model. You can see where the pancreatic cancer moves to the liver or the lungs, which are two main um, parts of two main organs that often are infected first after, after the pancreas. So one way to measure uh, the extent of the damage that pancreatic, uh, pancreatic cancer causes is through a permeability assay. So it is the measure in which how leaky your blood vessels can become after interacting with pancreatic cancer. So if you saw before with like day zero and day four, this is what happens at day 12 on the organ on a chip model is the tumor has pretty much just replaced the blood vessel. And that is a phenomenon called endothelial ablation. And that's something we have validated in our model that contributes to the problem of pancreatic cancer and why it's so difficult to treat is often any nutrients or um, drugs you try to treat pancreatic cancer with will drop off, drop off before it even reaches the pancreas in the first place. And so we want to be able to measure that. And what you can do is you can have this fluorescent marker um, called dextran and you can insert it. So you can insert it on the side with the um, red blood vessel channel and you can have a microscope image and calculate the flow rate and the intensity at which that fluorescent marker leaks out into the yellow space. And so here is some data that shows this. So like I mentioned before with the drug, so we had a specific drug called SB431542. Um, that's the experimental group and it targets a specific gene that we were investigating in pancreatic cancer. 
and then compare it with the control group, which is BMSO. And you can see for at least 60 seconds that there is a significant difference in the leakage of this dextran. Um, the showing how permeable, how more permeable the blood vessel becomes once interacting with pancreatic cancer without this drug inhibitor. So that's an in vitro model. And how you can see this in vivo is you take, um, when you look at a mouse, you can't do the same like um, microscopic like calculations with uh, this assay. So something you can still do is you can still look at the environment that's external to the blood vessel and you can insert, you can open up a mouse and then you can insert um, dextran to see the leakage and take images at a certain point in time to compare the two. So as you can see here with this type of dextran, uh, with the control group that there's a brighter intensity versus the experimental group. And so taking all this in mind about showing how the organ on a chip model can validate future experiments, I am now going to take this with the lymphatic system. So other people in my lab have worked with the lymphatic system. And so I want to be able to continue that pipeline of working with pancreatic cancer um, with the lymphatic system. And that starts with before the organ on a chip model. First, you have to find out what genes and drugs you even want to work with. And that starts with the simple idea of like co-culturing, putting two different groups of cells together. So um, lymphatic endothelial cells, which represent lymphatic vessels with um, pancreatic cancer cells. So you have them interact for like four days or so, and you take out the lymphatic endothelial cells and, and contrast it with um, a control group of lymphatic endothelial cells that don't interact with pancreatic cancer. And so then you can extract their RNA and then perform um, reverse transfer phase polymerase chain reaction or RT-PCR to get a measure of their chain expression levels and compare the two. So if you notice that, that the expression levels of a specific gene in the experimental group is different than the control group, then that could be a potential key candidate gene for us to look at. And then in which you can look for specific drugs that target that gene and then continue the organ on a chip model to the uh, in vivo mouse model pipeline. And so I like to always talk about um, how this is, how the organ on a chip model and how biomedical engineering research plays into a lot of different aspects of society and different dis academic disciplines. So like I mentioned before with um, biological research and engineer technology, um, another important thing to understand about the organ on a chip model is it's relatively new and it's very unpredictable. Um, so I've had issues in my lab where we have to troubleshoot, right? Why is the organ on a chip not working the way it does? And sometimes it's not with the experiment, it's with the actual chip. And that makes us go back to, okay, we have to figure out the chemistry and the physics of certain interactions with the different parts of an organ on a chip model. And um, I like to think about also the more broader implications with biomedical research, as fascinating as it can be. It's also kind of scary to think about uh, where we could go with this technology, but also remembering how this plays into broader ideas of medical ethics and how this impacts patients with like law and society. So I always like to think about sort of the greater aspects of this type of research because it's hard to imagine how something like that happens in the lab can really have big implications um, in the societal level. And also, uh, the organ on a chip model works for other disease states. So in my lab, there was an undergrad last year who did his honors thesis um, on trying to replicate um, brain lymphatics on a chip. And he was doing that so that eventually one day he could, be, he could use this for Alzheimer's disease to see if we can stimulate the conditions that can create us, that can create a possible solutions to treat Alzheimer's with this chip. Yeah, I guess I'll be sorry. Thank you so much, Jamie, for that great presentation. Now we'll take any questions. Sorry. Yes. Not really. Um, I we've only my grad student and I we've been working on we've only started really recently working on this. Um, and so we don't really have an answer because the reason why we're even looking at the lymphatic system is because of a different paper that has to do with like the intestine. So we're looking sort of at that paper to give us like an idea of what genes could be possible, but we don't really have anything for pancreas for the pancreas, um, pancreatic cancer cells. Just pause 
more about some of the broader impacts, like some examples you said it can affect like a legal person too. And yeah, so I think some people my like I have other friends in my lab where we talk sort of about how biomedical engineering research can be um, really powerful, but in ways we have to be careful with when we come up with certain ideas. I, I don't necessarily mean it in terms of like the organ on a chip model, but CRISPR, like sometimes some people in my lab do work on CRISPR and that with the organ on a chip model and that CRISPR has huge implications for like Ge um, genetic engineering. And that's really what I was getting at is like different things that you work with in organ like chip can lead to like more um, to other like perspectives, but we have to be careful with stuff like CRISPR because that plays into the concept of designer babies and stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. And then we can ask one of our pre-submitted pre questions here. What are other ways you can quantify the damage of pancreas, cancer, or other diseases in general, besides the permeability of estrogen you mentioned? So, um, as I mentioned before, metastasis. So, in my lab, like I said, it's not really possible to do it with an organ on a chip, but we want to be able to see if we can find a way to quantify metastasis in a chip so that we can see how that might play into um, metastasis of a mouse if we can sort of try to replicate that. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you so much for all your questions, everyone. Thank you for your amazing presentation. So the next present our last speakers. Okay, and with that, we've reached our final speakers for today. So last but definitely not least, we have Willem and Jody. Willem is a senior undergraduate majoring in operations research and surgeon studies. And Jody is a senior majoring in operations research and computer science. Willem and Jody and a team of other senior researchers have been collaborating on a way to design a better final exam schedule using combinatorial optimization. And their talk today will provide insight into how into the math and strategies behind making stressful advances in warfare. I'll now hand it off to them to get started. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming today. I'm Jody. And we all know that being a student at Cornell can be really stressful. And for a lot of students, final exam period is the most stressful time at all, of all. There's no, no wonder that we always hear friends complain and we, we read all types of banter on Reddit like this. This person over here calls the final exam schedule nonsense. And this person questions whether student concerns are being taken into account at all. By the end of this presentation, we hope to have convinced you that we do care about the students, being students ourselves, and it is the problems that's not so simple. Before the ORI department took over, it was a manual process and sometimes determined even before enrollment. Um, and conflicts were often seen as inevitable. After the first model was built, we tested the old schedule and it turns out it was closer to the worst possible schedule, meaning that a random schedule would have been better. We've come a long way since then, but first, what is a schedule? So here we have a small example of what a schedule could, could look like. Um, during the final exam period, it lasts about seven days and each day has three slots. This semester, I, there we have 19 slots and there are 553 exams. So our task is to take each exam and assign it to a time slot. This seems pretty simple, but there are many different schedules that you can come up with. For example, if we take oceanography here, we move it up to slots. Now we already have a different schedule. So in order to get a sense of the difficulty of this task, we ask ourselves, how many different schedules do we have to choose from? There is more than 14 and a bit over 700 zero possible schedules. That's a lot. So how do we define a good schedule? These are not all, but definitely the main metrics that we look at. First of all, we don't want conflicts. That means that a student has multiple exams in the same time slot. Um, we also don't want back-to-backs. It means a student has two exams in two consecutive slots. And we especially want to avoid the poor students who have three exams in a row. So in order to base on these metrics, choose a schedule out of all these different options, we need tools from operations research. Quoting Professor Williamson, operations research is using math to optimize the world around us. It is a uh, broad field of study, and the ORI department at Cornell offers classes in each of these areas. 
In our presentation and research, we'll be focusing on modeling, combinatorics, and optimization. An important tool we use is called integer programming. It is a great way to capture, represent different problems, and to solve them. Um, you might recall from elementary school, your teacher gave you a map that asked you to color in the states such that bordering states are not the same color. We've written that as an integer program on the left. Uh, always starting with decision variables. Here we have x and y's. x subscript ic equals 1 if state i is given color c. Otherwise, it's 0. Y subscript IJ equals one if state I and state J are in the same color, a zero otherwise. Our goal or objective function is to minimize the total number of bordering states that are the same color. If it equals zero, then it would mean that we found an optimal solution. Now to ensure that we have a valid feasible solution, we need constraints. The first constraint asks together the X's for each color for state I and requires it to equal one. This ensures that each state is given a color. The second constraint assigns the y values to one if state i and state j are the same color. Now, at first glance, this might look like a, into, uh, a system of equations on steroids, perhaps. But we now have very sophisticated solvers to help us solve them. And while it might not be obvious at first, this color problem is actually quite similar to final exam schedule. Um, Instead of grouping together states into different colors, we're grouping together exams that will take place at the same time. We could show these, uh, show these similarities more clearly by representing them as a graph. So a graph is a part of the language we use in operations research. It consists of nodes, which are the circles, and edges, which are the lines connecting the nodes. In the case of coloring problem, we might imagine the nodes being states and edges going between states that share a border. In the context of final exams, we can instead think of the nodes as exams. And now an edge will indicate that there is co-enrollment between both exams. We'll also give each edge, each edge a number or a weight, and that will indicate the number of students that are co-enrolled. For example, up top there, you have five students that are taking both ENGRI 1101 and EAS 1540. So, even though it might not be the most intuitive to you to think about this data in terms of graphs, looking at this underlying mathematical structure allows us to draw connections to other problems. And this allows us to use the same methods, the same algorithms, and the same ideas uh, across many different applications. So now we get into the exciting part. Now we're going to talk to you about how the exam schedule is made. Um, it is done in three general steps, and we'll give you an overview of each, starting with block assignment. Block assignment is our first step, and what we're doing is grouping together exams into what we call blocks. If you recall, there are 19 blocks this semester. So what we know is that classes in the same block will have their exams take place at the same time. What time specifically, we will determine later. Now, we could show this graphically by coloring classes in the same block with the same color. Uh, we could go ahead and count conflicts now. So for instance, in the green block, there's an edge weight of three, meaning three students are taking exams for both. If we add up the box numbers, we end up with six conflicts here. We could try different orientation blocks. For, uh, for example, we could move the bottom green class into the red block, and that improves our number of conflicts to four. Now, if you've been solving along with us, you might have already found the solution. Uh, so there does exist a zero conflict solution for this example here. Now, the thing when it comes to the real data set is that because it's so much bigger, we can't just eyeball it like we were doing here. This is where integer programming comes in. We will use the integer program to minimize the number of conflicts, ideally to zero. So after, block, after you've assigned each exam to blocks, we're now going to go ahead and assign the blocks to a time slot. We do this by giving the blocks an ordering. This is the sequencing step. So let's consider this ordering right here, where we have green, red, and yellow. Now we can count the number. Now that we have an ordering, we can count the number of back to backs. This shows which numbers we need to add up. Over there, you can see that all the green exams are hosted right before the red exams. So those eight people have back to backs, and that one person has back to backs as well. In total, we have 36 back backs in this with this order. What if we change the order? What if we switch green and red? 
And now we only have 21 back to backs. We found a better solution. So just like with block assignment, um, our real data has 553 nodes. So we can't just eyeball it. We once again need an integer program that finds the optimal ordering um, by minimizing back to backs, triples, and a handful of other metrics as well. Sequencing is also one of the one of the main areas where you've made improvement earlier this semester. The student assembly specifically asked us to look at this type of scenario as we have here on the right. It's where a student has two exams in a row, a free slot, and then another exam. You'll probably agree that this is not quite as bad as having three exams in a row, but it is much, much worse than having two exams in a row. And our model, and our model initially recognized this simply as a back-to-back. -back. The challenge here is that when you're counting back-to-backs and triples, you'll only need to look at three exam slots at a time. And there are just under 6,000 permutations of size three out of 90 <laughs> slots. However, to identify these types of scenarios, you need to look at four slots. All of a sudden, you're dealing with 93,000 permutations. So our model suddenly had 4 million variables, and the solver was barely making any progress. That's, so after this, after this, we really needed to um, experiment with different redesigns over integer program to find one that was better able to handle this complexity. And with that, we we're able to reduce the number of students with this type of scenario by 55 from just under 360 to just over 300. So far, this sounds like a pretty perfect plan besides the runtime issue. However, there is another issue caused by us splitting block assignment and sequencing into two steps. It is likely that we could have more than one equally good block assignment solution. But as you can see in this example here, when you sequence them, you might end up with different numbers of back-to-backs, triples, et cetera. So this is why we would need a post-processing step. So on a perhaps slightly simplified, but very intuitive level, what we do during post-processing is we take an exam, we see if we can put it into any other time slot so that it decreases the number of back-to-backs without increasing the number of conflicts. In terms, of our, in terms of our graph representation, what we do is we fix the order, we don't mess with our ordering anymore. But then we take an exam, we change its color. If it decreases the number of back-to-backs without increasing conflicts, we keep the change, and repeat. And even though this is a very simple idea, it had a huge effect on our schedule. The number of back-to-back -back exams went down from 2044 to 1451. The number of triples almost had, and all of this without increasing the number of conflicts. And even since the schedules come out, we have been we have continuously been working on this. One of the things that we did was instead of just taking one exam and moving it, what do we take? five exams or 50 exams or 100 exams and using yet another integer program to reorganize those optimally while keeping all the other exams um, fixed in their slots. So this has been very effective, but it does raise another question of how do we choose which exams to put into the integer program at each step? In other words, how do we identify which exams are most likely to lead to good moves? This is something that we've been improving as well. Uh, before we dive into the numbers, here are some intangible results that you might appreciate. So we did reduce the number of three and four slots and four in a row or quads as requested by the student assembly just to reduce stress among students overall. The registrar also asked us to reduce the number of large exams towards the end of the exam period, which we call front loading, so that more students can go home earlier. Uh, on the left are the stats for without front loading and on the right, is your spring 2022 final exam metrics. So we have zero conflicts, 1665 back to back, 76 triples, 271, three and four slots, and two quads. So what's next? As you all know, even though the final exam schedule for this semester is out, uh, we're still bursting with ideas and working really hard to keep improving this process to benefit students for many semesters to come. Um, I'm really diving into the post-processing step. I think that there is a lot of potential there, and I'm even secretly hoping that it might outperform block assignment and sequencing someday. On the other hand, I've been expanding the block assignment part to take into consideration time, essentially having an efficient piece of code to do the function of block assignment sequencing and remove the need for post-processing. 
Uh, lastly, exams are stressful, but we hope we made it a bit more bearable. And we want to acknowledge our, the other members of our team and our advisor, Professor David Schmoyes. Thank you guys for listening. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for the wonderful presentation, Will and Joey. Uh, so now we'll open up the community around again. Uh, and back and be all. So, which of the three sets has the most computational or complexity? And how do you know which they fit in that schedule? Mm. So, block assignment and scheduling. Um, because they are written as an integer program, we can solve them to optimality. Well, the last step is using heuristics. So there's like no guarantee there, but um, the first two steps is it takes a long time. And like, just because our solution has to be integer that adds to the complexity of it. Um, do you have anything on? Yeah, I think that um, a lot of the complexity of problems comes from the fact that we're working with integer variables. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that in terms of time um block assignment i think takes like 18 hours yeah. um sequencing still takes a while um and then but but post-processing is very quickly and only takes 25 minutes or so um yeah i hope that kind of answers your question so obviously like year to year there's a lot of similar classes with the same enrollment ish do you find that creating the final exam schedule every semester, you can like reliably use the model from before, or do you have to like redo everything every semester? Um, everything is redone every semester. It's definitely something, there's definitely some potential there, some machine learning potential there as well, perhaps you could kind of reuse those patterns, uh, but now everything, um, but now every, the, the whole process is done again every year. I guess uh, to add to that, what we're doing is relatively new, um, and then like fall semester, spring semester are very different. Um, and actually today we were talking about idea of like if we could use like deep learning and whatnot to do get like a good schedule that we could just make minor modifications to in the future. That's, I guess that's the goal, long, long term goal. Yeah. You said you're working specifically with this year, with this year's assignment. Mm -hmm. Are you guys kind of looking at like making a model Is that, that's, yeah. mm -hmm. I'm in the corner. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I feel like you actually now, like, you are prioritized to try to reduce the conflict as uh, much as possible. So, is there a, another possibility, like, uh, you're not like a prioritize the conflict, say, like, you increase the conflict, the conflict uh, by a little bit, but like, significantly reduce the back effect of that? Is that uh, like, possible or doable? Um, that is very possible. That is, um, so we made a change so that post-processing can do that, um, so that it can, you know, sacrifice a couple conflicts, uh, even if it means, um, even if it, mean, if it means that the number of back-to-backs reduces by, I don't know, a lot. Uh, so I think it's definitely something that we could see in future statistics, definitely. Okay, so we'll have one more question for the is there any possibility of using kind of a similar system to optimize the course schedule, or is that all three being done? Oh, we're laughing because it is actually being done and using integer programs. Um, uh, it, well, I guess they really started doing that um, after COVID hit. But yes, a lot of the same techniques that we introduce here can be applied there as well. Although with that, the main issue is that we don't know when the when classes are scheduled, we don't know which students are gonna take which classes. That is really the, the biggest barrier to that. Okay, so we will conclude our final Q&A. Uh, thank you, Will and Jody, for your presentation. <laughs>
learned something new from these wonderful presentations. I know I did. And I'd like to take a quick moment to thank all the people who helped make this conference possible. First, I want to thank my committee members up here, Eleanor, Olivia, and Vipin, for all of their hard work. I would also like to thank our current co presidents up in the back there, Jen and Arson, for all of their help with this and also helping me run and grab the pizza right now. So, and finally, the last thank you goes out to you all for being such a wonderful audience. As I mentioned, as a token of our appreciation, we have some pizza and many chocolate chip cookies up there in the back for you. Feel free to pick up some food as you are leaving. Have a great rest of the night and stay tuned for fall 2020 for events.